Good morning, Sweet Waters Church. It is my privilege and honor that we are doing something new and dynamic this morning, and we are privileged to have you guys watching this feed with us. With all that's happening in our world and our country, we are privileged also to have technology that allows us, even though we are separated and we are not in one building worshiping God together, we have the privilege of having technology to actually connect us. And so we want to use this opportunity to thank you for plugging in to Sweetwater's Church TV. And we're going to have an amazing time watching a sermon preached by Pastor Nishan and just going to continue to worship God even in this time of adversity. Next to me is Pastor Matabo, and she's going to lead us in an opening prayer. So yeah, let's just focus on what God's going to do this morning for us. Good morning, Sweetwater's Church. Let us pray. I'm just going to declare Psalm 91 over us. Father, I thank you that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High and we abide under the shadow of the Almighty Lord. We therefore say of you, Lord, you are our refuge and our fortress, our God in whom we trust. Thank you, Father, that it is a sure thing that you have delivered us from the snare of the fowler through Jesus Christ at Calvary and from the uh, perilous pestilence. Thank you, Father, for covering us with your feathers and under your wings, Father God, we take refuge. Your truth is our shield and buckler. We are not afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by night, nor of the pestilence that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it shall not come near us. Only with our eyes, Father God, we thank you that we shall look and see the reward of the wicked. Father, we have made you Jesus Christ our Lord. We have made Jesus Christ our refuge, even you most high, our dwelling place. Thank you, Father, that no evil shall befall us, nor shall any plague come near our home or near our dwelling or near our children or near our houses, Father God, or even near our church. For you shall give your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. In their hands they shall bear us up, lest we dash our foot against a stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. We shall trample underfoot. Father, we have set our love upon you. Therefore, Father, because we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, thank you that you have delivered us. Thank you that you have set us on high because we know your name and that of your Son, the name of Jesus that is above all name, the name that every knee will bow to, the name that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Father, that this morning your word says that before we even called you, you have answered us. Thank you that even at this time, Father God, when the world is troubled, Lord Jesus, you said that we must not let our hearts be troubled. We must trust in God, our Father, and also trust in you because you are Emmanuel, God with us. Therefore, as we open this service, Father God, we thank you that you are our God and we are protected under the shadow of your wings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, viewers. Just want to encourage you to please get up on your feet and to praise and worship just as you would in church. The word says, when two or more are gathered, he is here in our midst. As a family, when you worship, I just want you to, to know that God is present. God is present through this time of trouble. I just want to encourage you to just praise and worship and let's lift up a shout of praise. Amen. Greatest thing in history, death has beaten, you have rescued me, singing out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day, singing out, Jesus is alive. Face to face, I'm yours, but Jesus, you are mine. And this joy and perfect peace, earthly pain 
finally we'll see celebrate Jesus is alive He's alive Oh, happy day Happy day And you wash my sin away Oh, happy day Happy day I'll never be the same glorious way that you have saved me oh what a glorious name what a glorious name that you have saved me oh happy day happy day you wash my sin away oh
Jesus. Father, you are higher than any other. Jesus, we just want to humble ourselves before you this morning. Come and have your way, Lord. Father, you are our healer. You are our protector, Father. You are our provider when things seem to be going wrong, Lord. We know we have the assurance, Father, that we can run to you, Jesus. We can run to you, Lord, knowing that you are there with open arms, Lord. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your unending love, Jesus. Father, you are Yeshua. Thank you, Jesus.
than the name of Jesus. We extol you. We glorify you. Thank you, Jesus, that your presence fill this place. Every heart and every home, Lord God, will feel your anointing, Father. Every person, Lord, connected, Father, will understand, Lord Jesus, uh, that, Lord, you sent your word, Father, to heal our disease, Father. We thank you that your hand is not too short, that you cannot reach us, Lord God. You're a God that neither slumbers nor sleeps, Lord. You are a God almighty. We worship you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We love you, God. We thank you, Jesus. So we give you the glory. And we give you the honor. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, it's wonderful just to bless the name of Jesus. Just to give Him all the glory. To give Him all the praise and all the adoration. He's wonderful. He's awesome. He's a good God. That's important to understand today. Is that He is a good God. And today, from wherever you, wherever you are watching, we want to encourage you. We know that we are here today to give glory and honor to God. Because the God that we serve, He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or ask for. Therefore, we know in whatever context we are, we can still praise the Lord. And we know this is the time where the Bible says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And today, even as we come to this juncture of our service, 
And as you worship with us, with your families, and as you are together in one accord, giving glory and honor to God, one of the things the Bible assures us, where it says in the book of Philippians 4 verse 19, my God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. There is no shadow of doubt that God is able to supply and you may be at this moment wondering what is happening in our country and all sorts of thoughts may be going in your mind. I want to show you today that we serve a good God. We serve a faithful God who is able to supply everything that you need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So have no shadow of doubt today that God is able to undertake. As we will worship together, uh, you will have an opportunity uh, the banking details will be on the screen and you'll be able to just worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings and understand today this is an important part of our worship, an important component of our worship that we worship Him even with our substance. So I want to encourage you today as we worship and continue to just uh, uh, come into the presence of the Lord, you have an opportunity now to give unto the Lord. God bless you. As we bless your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we bless your holy name. For you are great, you do miracles so. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are the provider. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you always take care of your children. And Father, this moment as we turn to your word, Lord God, we know, Father, we need strength from your word. Your word is the only place where we can turn to, Lord God. And we pray, Father, that you will strengthen your people and that your people will know today, Lord Jesus, that you care for them, and that you have everything under control. We give you glory now in Jesus' powerful name. Amen and amen. Friends, I want to talk to you on the subject, God is still in control. 
And it's important for us to know that, that he's still in control. And so even as our country goes and the entire globe experiences this pandemic, COVID-19, we know it's not an easy time. But as a church and as leaders, we need to come together, pray for one another, stand with one another, support one another. We shouldn't be splitting theological airs as to why we do certain things. No, that's not the time to do that. This is the time that we support one another. This is the time that the body of Christ stands together in agreement, supporting one another. We also have a part to play, even in our country. And as leaders, you have influence both uh, with people in the faith and people out of the faith that respect you as a leader, as a pastor, and whatever your portfolio is in the fivefold ministry, we know that people respect you. And so it's important for us to play our role, which is an important role as the church. And I also believe today we need to honor, uh, as Romans 13 says, we need to also honor uh, the word that says we have to submit even to authorities. And we know in the crisis, in this pandemic globally, that there are many restrictions in terms of us. Uh, we've heard the, the phrase that we need to flatten the curve and we've seen such a high rise in cases, even here in South Africa. And our hearts also go out to those in, in Italy. And we know they've, they've been day after day. It's just been uh, multiple deaths and hundreds and hundreds of people uh, have, been, have, have passed on. And it's a real tragedy. And I believe that we need to play our part, whether it's social distancing, whether it is sanitizing our hands, or whatever part you have to play, let's do it as a church. Let's not try to split theological airs as to what you believe. Yes, we believe in the anointing. We believe we are covered with the blood of Jesus. But we also understand that when there are rules and regulations set by the government, the Bible says it's for your protection and it is for my protection. And so when we do that, we truly honor the Lord because all governments and all infrastructures are placed there by God. It is not the idea of man. We know that God is still in control, that He's still on the throne. He's still on the throne. We see people are riddled with fear, wondering, how can I keep it together in, this, in these difficult times? And let's be honest, so many of us, we've washed our hands so much that it's almost wrinkled and it's gone so soft. You don't need any other lotion. But never has there been a time in history where collectively, Every country is struggling with the same dilemma, namely COVID-19. So many countries are close to exhausting all their resources, not knowing what to do in order to fight this terrible virus. We see stock markets crumble. So many businesses come to a halt. The situation seems bleak. But how do we respond as sons and daughters of God? We need to understand today that everything that is currently happening in the world has been divinely orchestrated by God. How do I have any biblical evidence and proof for that? We look at even the plagues of Egypt. It was not sent by Satan. It was orchestrated by God himself so that Pharaoh would humble himself. Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened, would let go of the people of God who were under bondage even in Egypt. And we know the pharaohs of this world that refuse to submit, the pharaohs of this world that, that feel that they are invincible through these times, understand that there's nowhere else to turn to but God. We look at the story uh, in the book of Job and we look at the suffering of Job and what he went through and the Bible articulates to us in Job chapter 1 that when the sons of God came together, the angels of God, it said that Satan also entered the courts of the Lord. And God asked him, where you've been? He said, I've been to and fro uh, the earth. And then he, God asked him a question, have you considered my, my servant Job? A righteous man, a one who loves God, a one who eschews evil. And then we find out there that, that, that God set the boundaries 
for Satan in regards to Job, that he only could afflict him in a certain aspect of his life or in certain areas. The Bible says in Job 1 verse 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Notice he says, the Lord said to Satan, everything he has is in your power, but don't lay a hand upon him. He had divine protection. So we find that Satan could not operate outside of the sphere of God's demarcated boundaries. That God demarcates the boundaries. Satan could not go across those boundaries. He could not in any way violate the conditions that God said. So what is my point? Is that God sets the boundaries. Is that God himself is orchestrating everything that we see happening in our country and happening in our world. So we know that God is in control. That God is on the throne. The Bible also says to us in the New Testament, in Romans 8 verse 28, and we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Yes, all things. This verse is not only applicable in good times. The, this verse is not only applicable to certain conditions, it's applicable right now. And therefore, you and I today, have to understand that all things is working together for a purpose. God is still in perfect control. Notice something, God hasn't lost the plot. God has not forgot what to do. God is not in heaven somehow panicking, oh, what do I do? God is in perfect control. But the Bible also assures us in Psalms 46 verse 1, that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And the word refuge means shelter. It means hope. It means trust. He's our shelter. He's our hope. This hope that we have is sure and steadfast and which enters the presence. We have every confidence that God is a very present help in time of trouble. I love how the voice translation says it, that God is our shelter and our strength when trouble seems near. God is nearer and He's ready to help. So why run and hide? I love that. It says when trouble seems near, that God is nearer. So why do we run and hide? And many people feel that we just need to just uh, go into a cocoon or, or, or just hide ourselves from what is happening. But we have every confidence in this, that God is a very present help. And I was looking at the Spiritual Study Bible, and, and, and it, it basically gives us an exposition of what the word present help means. And I love this. It means a help that has been found to be reliable, a proven it's proven or to be a reliable stronghold in the past so that any future calamity is no reason to fear. You have no reason to fear. Why? God has a trusted, tried, and proven record. He is worthy. He's, he, we, we can trust Him. So anything that we face in the future, there's no reason to fear any calamity. Notice this one thing, that the Word of God is timeless, therefore it is timely in its application. The Word of God is relevant right now, at this moment. It's not seasonal, it's for all seasons, it's for all dispensations, it is always relevant. And so we can trust the Word of God. I want to show you today, friends. That the God that we serve, He's the God of the hills and He's the God of the valleys. And what, what am I talking about? In 1 Kings 20 verse 28, there's a story and I want to contextualize it before I read the passage of Scripture. There's a time that where uh, King Ben-Hadad of Syria comes against King Ahab. 
And he comes and he's allied with 32 other forces, 32 other kings. Together they are, uh, they are working together to destroy God's people. And they seem more powerful, they seem more strong, they seem more prepared even to destroy God's people. And there comes a point where uh, God miraculously speaks through the prophets and speaks to Ahab and gives him specific instructions of what to do. I don't know about you, but I believe in the prophetic voice. I believe in the word of God. And I believe true prophets are rising at this time to speak and to say, thus saith the Lord. And we should stand in authority and be able to declare that the word of God is yea and amen. That God is not a man that he should lie. And here comes a point. That word comes to King Ben-Hadad. And it says, it says to them, listen. The God of the Israelites is only the God of the hills. He's not the God of the valleys. So here it says in 1 Kings 20 verse 28, Then a man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. What was happening here? The Syrians basically believed that God was a localized deity. And this was a prominent thought even in the ancient world. This is what they believed. They felt that particular gods had only authority in a particular domain. That was their influence and their authority. So because the recent victory that the Israelites won was on the hills or on the hill terrain, here the servants of the king believed that the God of Israel was a localized deity only effective in a particular location. You know what I'm saying? That's what they believed because they made gods with hands and they believed God was only strong or powerful in a particular location. So they knew that the God of Israel defeated them on the hills, but he was not powerful in the valleys. I'm here to tell you. That the devil is a liar. And what am I trying to say today? That God's realm of influence supersedes man's limited perception of him. God's realm of influence is far greater than you and I can conceive. He's not just the God of the hills. He's the God of the valleys. And right now you may be feeling you are in the valley. But the Bible says he's with us even in the valley of the shadow of death. In the valley, that is the place where the greatest things happen in the valley. In the valley, you would find out in any study, um, you, you would find out uh, that, that the, some of the most... Uh, Beautiful things and the most rarest of things are given birth in the valley. So understand he's the God of the hill and he's the God of the valleys. Don't ever underestimate his influence. Don't define God by your standards. He cannot be localized. He cannot be standardized. He cannot be contained. You cannot dictate to him what he can do and what he cannot do. He is God all by himself. He is still on the throne. I love what our moderator of the full gospel church, Dr. Stafford Peterson said. He says, a God you create is a God you can control. So you can't dictate your terms and conditions to this God. This God is all powerful. This God is great and mighty. He is God on the throne. And today we can, be, we can draw strength and faith from God's word to know he's God of the hills and he's the God of the valleys. You know what I thought about it and I mentioned to you that all things work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And I mentioned to you one thing that God has orchestrated everything that's happening in the world. I want you to think about this. Do you know there are places in the world 
where people would practice sin openly, they have been shut down. Think about it. Follow me. There are places in the world that were truly, you could say, the hub of sin, that openly and defiantly would sin and mock and blaspheme the name of the Lord. They have been shut down. A place like Las Vegas, you think about it, they haven't closed for centuries. They are closed down. Places of sin. Do you know, even at this time in the world, it's actually difficult to sin. The bars, many places are on lockdown. The bars are closed. The pubs are closed. The casinos are closed. The nightclubs are closed. My worry is that some of the Christians are even more worried about that. How many of you know God is up to something? I was listening to Dr. S.Y. Govender, who is a powerful man of God that, uh, you know, runs the ABC Forum, and he's also a medical doctor. And he mentioned the principles of quarantine. And the whole principle of quarantine is not the idea of civil government. It's actually biblically... Uh, it, it, it's in the Bible. You would find in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that there are laws of quarantine. For example, if someone had leprosy, somebody had an infectious disease, somebody had a discharge, they would be quarantined. Why were they quarantined? They, so that they, they would be in a place where you would not be infected. So you would also, uh, it, 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 the, the principle basically was for your protection, but it was also for their protection. But now there's different types of quarantine that's happening in the world. There's also quarantine where people are on lockdown that they have to stay in one location. They are quarantined. They are in a particular location and in certain countries you have to have a certified document just to leave your house. But the principles that are there that, that we believe in is not the idea of civil government. It's actually in the Bible. Those principles because it was for the, the protection of the people. You sense in the world right now that there's a global cleansing a supernatural cleansing by God's refining fire happening. Places that truly defied God. Places of uh, satanic worship. Places that truly were, were created only for one intention. And that was to truly mock the principles of God's word. They have been shut down. You know what I've also noticed? is people are starting to pray. You know what's the funny thing now that we are not having, the services have been temporarily suspended? One of the things I've noticed, people who never ever used to come to church suddenly asking, when are we having church? <laughs> people who never used to worry about prayer are, are asking, when is prayer meeting? And that is why we should always, and, and I, I preach this all the time, that never ever take church gatherings for, for granted. Because when you don't have it, you really miss it. When you don't have it, you, you sense that emptiness, those corporate gatherings. And, and sometimes people take that for granted. They just feel that it's always going to be there. It's something that all, was always there. Our parents had it. We will have it. Our children will have it. And suddenly when there are restrictions, like the president has now issued this d decree, uh, and, 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 and we find that you cannot have a gathering over 100 people, and you find there are all these restrictions and the many church buildings that cannot have church anymore. There's, they really feel it. But the one thing and the confidence we have is that the church is not the building. You and I are the church. Yes, the building may be closed, but church will never ever be shut down. The people of God will always be a praising people. In fact, I believe this season is the greatest season for the church. In fact, this season, we're going to find that the church is going to go forward. There's going to be things that we are going to be experiencing, the supernatural power and presence of God like we've never experienced before. These are the greatest moments because the darkest moments of the world 
are the greatest moments for the church. We are the light of the world. We are the salt. And therefore, we today should not be glum and numb and depressed. You can be in your home with your children. Lift up your hands and praise the Lord. You can be with your children, uh, with your spouse. Uh, have some holy communion together. Pray for one another. Worship the Lord together. Open your Bible. Study the Word of God together. Amen. We can do that. We can have church anywhere. One thing I also know is that the family is coming together. Many medical experts and others predict that there could be a lockdown heading, into our, heading for our country, for our province, and possibly the entire country. And one thing I notice with countries that are currently on lockdown is that the families have to be contained in a certain environment. And this scripture came to mind in Malachi 4, verse 5 to 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And notice what God says, the hearts of the fathers must be turned to the children, otherwise there are going to be consequences. He will, he will uh, pronounce a curse. And I've noticed now, families which have been broken and fragmented, marriages that were divided, uh, suddenly now are contained in the same environment. In other words, fathers have to talk to their sons. Husbands and wives have to communicate. There's a story I read about a man who decided to go outside of his marriage and to, to have an affair. And he went to another country and he con contracted the coronavirus by having an affair. So people now have to be, we have to work things out. The family now has to talk with each other. Are you hearing me today? The family now, fathers and sons are coming together. The family is, is, is being strengthened together. So there's a purpose even for quarantine. There's a purpose even for isolation. There's a purpose for even being in a contained environment. The family now has to connect. The family now has to ensure that there is proper communication. But I want to say something that is very important, and I believe this is for everyone, and even for, for leaders and, and for nations, that this season demands humility and repentance. The back of pride must be broken in order for us to get God's attention. The back of pride has to be broken in order for us to get God's attention. The season demands humility. It demands repentance. You know, the enemy wants to brainwash you. And I'm going to go to the book of Daniel. And when Daniel came into Babylonian captivity, a name was given to him, Belshazzar. And Belshazzar means may Bel protect his life. Who was Bel? Bel was uh, the Babylonian's chief god. But his name, Daniel actually meant God is my judge. I want you to know protection comes from God and God alone. God is my judge. He is my judge. Bell cannot protect you. The systems of this world cannot protect you. And I mentioned how we need to humble ourselves, how we need to repent and come before God with penitence, with brokenness, with a contrite heart unto God. The Bible in Daniel 4 verse 28 to 33 talks about King Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible says that at the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. And here he said, the king said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by the mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? The Bible says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, 
And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you until you know, listen to this, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. This man who pride began to, to dwell within him. This Babylon that I have built. He started to deify himself. And God immediately the voice of the Lord came and dealt with him. And he became insane. In fact, he even became like an animal, as the Bible says. It says that very hour in verse 33, it was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and he ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. This man that wanted to deify and give himself all the glory. And when I think about that, I found out that so many nations and so many leaders have glorified themselves, have deified themselves, have taken all the credit. They've somehow left out God. They've taken him out of the schools. They've taken him out of government. They've taken him out of legislature. They've taken him out of everything. The God that protected them and created them and made them, they've somehow dethroned God and they have taken the place of God. And God says, I will not tolerate that. This is what Nebuchadnezzar did. God said, you are going to become an insane animal. You are going to eat grass. And this man who was so powerful, but the story doesn't end there. The Bible said Nebuchadnezzar, at that moment while he was eating grass and he was relegated to being an animal, at the end of the time it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and I praised and I honored Him who lives forever for His dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth and no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me for the glory of my kingdom and my honor and my splendor was returned to me. My counselors and my nobles resorted to me and listen to this, I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways are justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Whatever is happening, friends, is orchestrated by God. When you find that all the systems and technology and medical science are totally in a conundrum, they don't know what to do. It is God humbling the nations of the world, the leaders of the world, the so-called forces and influential people of the world. Until they come to a point and they give glory and honor to God and recognize who God is. You know what the Bible says? As Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was restored to him, that's when restoration is going to truly take place. True restoration. Doesn't the Bible say in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God demands repentance. He, de he demands us to humble ourselves. Notice this, this verse has a twofold condition for a threefold benefit. He says, if you humble yourself, you pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. It says, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. But it says, my people 
Who are my people? It's you and me, those that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He's saying, I'm telling you guys, you people, if you will humble yourself and pray, don't do what everyone else is doing. Everyone else is running helter-skelter. They don't know what to do. You know what to do. Humble yourself and pray. Seek my face. Turn away from your wickedness. I will answer you. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive and I'll bring healing to your land. I love what Job 22 verse 23 says. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. You will, you will remove iniquity far from your tents. Revelation talks about the seven trumpet. It says there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world... Have, becomes the, the, have become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Friends, I want you to know today, there is no name higher than the name of Jesus. There is no name, there's no virus, nothing on the face of this earth, and even under the earth that's greater than the name of Jesus. Several countries and presidents and astute world leaders are calling for prayer, for national days of prayer. They are realizing that even with the best minds and the finest minds uh, coming together, the most brilliant men and women, the most highly educated professors and scientists coming together, they are still baffled and they are saying we need to pray and humble ourselves and seek God. Thousands in this moment in history, thousands are surrendering to Jesus Christ. Many are asking, is this the apocalypse? Are these the end times? But I just have a few more points to share to you today. Number one is God has promised to protect His children. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will, he will not leave you and He will not forsake you. Friends, God has promised to stick with you. God has promised you and He says to you, be strong, be courageous, be ready for the fight. Be ready for whatever is coming your way. That I have strengthened you, I've given you the power to confront it, to deal with it, to go head on. To face your Goliath. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. God has also promised to provide. Many people are wondering what's going to happen with our jobs. What's going to happen in the country's economy. I'm here to tell you today, the principles of God's word must work. God's word is our ultimate authority. God's word is the final blueprint. There is no other way to turn. And he says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Know about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And he goes on to say, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. He's saying, don't worry. Don't be anxious. And in 633, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added unto you. Friends, I say here today without apology, and I will never recant the statement that our God will never fail you. Our God has promised to protect you. He's promised to provide for you. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And he says to us, he admonishes us, don't lose it. Don't forget what I'm saying. I will make a way for you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what's going to happen. The next point is God has promised peace. He says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Friends, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And so I want you to know today, the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding will be your portion. 
The next point is this. You need to trust in the credibility of your God. The credibility of our God. What does credibility mean? It's the quality of being trusted and believed in. The Word of God says in Nehemiah 9 verse 6, You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Look at the credibility, the powerful God that we serve. Uh, he is Jehovah Sabahoth, the Lord of the hosts, or the Lord of angel armies. He is, uh, uh, as the Bible says, El Elyon, the most high God. He is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. He is Adonai. He is the master and owner of everything. He is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. He is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. He is credible. He is the creator of the heavens of the, and the earth. All things are sustained by Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. Friends, God will not fail you. God, God He's got your back. The next point is this, we must increase our faith through diligent study and meditation of God's Word. We do not know the future or what may happen, but when you are alone, it's the best thing you can do is devote yourself to the study of God's Word. Diligent study and meditation of God's Word. The word meditate, it actually means it's, 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 it's of the cow that will chew the cud. It will chew it, extract the nutrients, and it will swallow it again and bring it up again, chew it, and extract the nutrients. And we need to meditate on God's Word. Study God's Word. Soak in God's Word. Psalms 119 verse 50 said, This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me life. Your word has given me. This is my comfort in my affliction. I know the longer you watch CNN and Sky News and E! News or whatever news, the longer you watch it, you can get very depressed. You can get very depressed. The moment you think something is coming right, it just gets worse. But take some time. Yes, we must know what's happening around the world. We must keep ourselves updated. That's all good and well. But this is the time to really spend time with God's Word. Really, really meditate upon that Word. Allow that Word to renew your mind, to transform your thinking, and to empower you. This is what we need. The next point is we must pray with strong faith that God will bring healing to all those that are suffering. Friends, people around the world that are dying, we must, we must be compassionate. We must pray for them with a burden. Don't, don't, don't say things like, that's China, that's Italy, that's Spain, that's Iran. We need to truly come to a place where we, we are able to pray with a burden and realize that Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are mourning the loss of their loved ones. We need to pray for healing. We need to pray that God would console them. God will provide for them. We need to feel for our brothers and sisters. And not just feel, I'm okay, I'm fine, I don't have the virus. But even we need to pray for those that have contracted the virus in our country. And even in our community, we need to show them compassion we need to pray for them. We need to feel for them and see in which way we can stand with them. It's a time for prayer. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer will never fail. The Bible says Elijah was a man just like you and me with natural affections. He wasn't perfect. But when he prayed, things began to happen. When he said no rain, there was no rain. When he said it must rain, it began to rain. And the Bible calls us to pray. My last point is this, that we must pray for boldness to share our faith 
to those who are lost. Friends, many people are panicking. Many people don't know what to do. Many don't have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is the most opportune time to give people Jesus. This is the most opportune time to tell people it's going to be okay. This is the opportune time to share the message of salvation, the message of the cross that Jesus Christ died for them. Ask God for boldness to share your faith. The world needs help. The world is in trouble. You and me are the solution. We have Jesus Christ in us who is the answer. I think of that song, Gavin, you probably know it by Andre Crouch. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him is no other. Jesus is the way. He is the answer for the world today. He is the answer for you and me. The Bible says the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Think about that. The righteous are bold as a lion. I think Peter and John, when they were ministering, and they were coming under persecution, it says, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. This time and season demands bold children of God that will share their faith. I'm going to ask you today to pray. Wherever you are with your families and wherever the service is being streamed, I want you to just stand together with your families. And let's just pray in one accord today. Let's just pray. And I want to pray for you today and pray for the entire Sweetwaters congregation. And I want to pray for whoever is listening to the stream. That you will know that Jesus truly loves you. He cares about your well-being. In fact, the word of God assures us. That God loved us so much that he gave his only son to die for you and me. But if you believe in him, you won't perish. But you will have eternal life. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now may be the opportune time to say, Jesus Come into my life. Forgive me for all my sin. I make you my Lord and my Savior. I surrender my life to you. Father, I pray for every single person, every individual, every family, for the Sweetwaters Church family. I pray your touch. I pray for your anointing. I pray for your grace. I pray, Lord Jesus, during these troubled times, that they will know, Lord God, you are still the answer, Lord God. You are still able to protect them, Lord. Your word says in Psalms 91, Lord God, that even the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that even roams at noonday will be able to touch us, Lord God. That you will surely save us from the foul, foul snare and from the deadly pestilence, Lord. You promise to protect us. You promise to be our shield and our rampart, Lord God, at this time and this juncture in history, Father. I pray, Father, that your people will know that you are the provider. We worship you. We honor you, Lord. We give you our praise. I pray, Lord God, you will give each one of them your peace, Lord God. As your word says, you give us your peace, not the peace that the world gives us, Lord God. And you said you have overcome the world. You've deprived the world of its power to harm us, Lord God. Therefore, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will just protect your people, Lord God. Give them peace, Lord God. Let them be strong during this season. Let them seek you like never before. Those that are sick in body, you will heal them. Father, we pray for our country as well, Lord God. And in unison, in one accord, as the family of God, we pray for South Africa. We pray for our president. We pray for his cabinet and the task force, Lord God, that are attacking and dealing with this virus, Lord. We know in Jesus' name, Father, 
Father, we pray as we give you the glory that, Father, this virus has no power over the child of God. We come against it in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, today, you will protect your children, Lord. You will preserve your children. You will sustain your children. Give our government the wisdom, the knowledge. We pray for the leaders of the world, Father. We pray for families that are mourning. We pray for those that are in ICU beds that are struggling to breathe because of this virus. We pray, let there be healing. Let healing flow in Jesus' powerful name. We trust you. We give you praise and honor. We pray for every family, every individual listening to this message that you will bless them supernaturally. You will touch them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we are always praying for you. If you ever have any need, please contact our church. The details will be on the screen. Know that we love you. Know that the building may not always be operational, but we are still the church. This is the time to stand and be counted. Stand up for your faith. Contend for the faith, as Jude says, that was once delivered unto the saints. God bless you and God be with you.